So, um, apologize for the glasses. Uh, I'm Jake Edge. I'm from uh, LWN.net. We like to uh, think of it as uh, the premier news and information source for uh, free software and Linux developers. Um, we certainly have a developer focus. Um, I've written a bunch of articles from the conference already, and no doubt we'll write some more. Um, if you haven't visited, uh, please uh, give, us, give us a look. Um, that's the advertising part of the show, I guess. Uh, moving on from there. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, namespaces for security. I uh, write the, the security page, or I edit the security page, and generally write the, the lead on that weekly for LWN. Um, so I claim to know something about security, and I'm learning about uh, namespaces. There we go, sorry. So um, what are we gonna talk about today? Um, so first off, we're gonna start talking, uh, to, talking about threats, the kinds of threats that, uh, that we want to protect against. Um, talk about the kinds of effects the, that uh, attacks, um, that those threats basically can, can cause. Um, the defenses that, that uh, are typically used to, uh, to thwart or reduce the effectiveness of those attacks. Um, and then get into namespaces and, uh, and what types of namespaces there are, how they're created, uh, um, a little bit about how they're used, um, some examples. Um, that's kind of an overview of, of uh, where we're going today. So we, uh, this is the Embedded Linux Conference, so we'll sort of try to, to focus a little bit of, on, on embedded um, devices. And one of the big problems for an embedded device maker is a, a mass attack. When some attacker out there figures out some sort of vulnerability in a, let's say, a home router that an ISP has put 100,000 of into people's homes and they own, you know, some large percentage of those, of those routers and the device maker gets a black eye and the ISP gets a black eye and not only that, but the customers, you know, your customers have now been uh, violated essentially. So it's, it's not just a PR problem, it's, you know, it's a real problem. And that normally happens uh, through some sort of network facing service. Um, the, you know, web browser, or sorry, web servers are the, are the sort of most likely one, um, but there are other networks, network services that, uh, that could be affected. Um, or some, sometimes it's a network client. Um, you know, maybe the device has some sort of um, update service that it, well, not service, sorry, update client that it runs that goes out and talks to a service to see if there's an update available for the device. Um, so if an attacker can interfere with that traffic in some way, they may be able to do something um, uh, bad to the, to the device. Um, DNS cache poisoning is kind of in that same uh, area. You know, if, if I can convince your DNS uh, cache, or if I can change your DNS cache so that it believes that the mapping from a particular name, an important name to an address is wrong, I can do um, a, a variety of different uh, nasty things. Um, web applications, of course, are the, are the, the um, <clears throat> sort of poster child for, for the kinds of uh, threats that, that are faced, and, and more and more devices are having uh, web uh, interfaces of various sorts, either for configuration or monitoring, or maybe that's part of what the application or the, or the function of the device uh, is. Um, and cross-site attacks are sort of one of the more common attacks for web applications that you hear about. That's cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, those kinds of things. So those are the kinds of threats that a device faces. Um, and the, you, what is it that uh, an attacker is going after when, they, when, when a, you know, a device is attacked I mean, typically, I mean, if, a, if an attacker is targeting a particular individual, all bets are off. That's, that's a, a very hard s attack or a scenario to, to handle. But the more common situation that we see is, is where a, an attacker or a group of attackers are attacking a, a mass, doing a mass attack of a, of a large number of devices or systems. 
through a single kind of vulnerability or, or a multi-vulnerability uh, cocktail, I suppose. <clears throat> so what, they're, what, are, what are they trying to do? What, what's, what's the, the end goal? Um, and, and the end goal really is to compromise the system in some way, and that typically means compromising a service, and then that means that the attacker can run code with the abilities that the, um, that the user ID associated with that service has. And that user ID doesn't need to be any kind of privileged user. Most regular users on a Linux system have lots of capabilities that a, an attacker might want to use. You know, the ability to use the network, make connections on the network, uh, uh, you know, set up servers to accept connections on the network as long as they use a high numbered port, um, look at the file systems. There's you know, various kinds of information in the file systems. Um, other processes are out there, and those processes may, in fact, contain interesting information. So um, if, if the user that gets compromised has network access, then uh, the attacker could use it to send spam, to do a distributed denial of service, um, to make the, the system join a botnet for other um, kinds of things. File system access, there could be confidential information or configuration information, or the uh, system itself, uh, maybe, you know, maybe it's a storage server of some kind, and so, you know, its whole functionality is to make available all of this information, um, which is, you know, maybe the target of, of the attacker. Um, and pro if, if you can access processes, then if those processes, let's say, have contained credentials from, you know, a user on the other end, let's say, you know, username, password kinds of things, or, uh, you know, keys, um, processes in their, inside of their memory often have useful information that, that an attacker might want to get access to. Um, so, if they can access the processes, that you know, that's that's the kind of thing they might be able to do. They can also send a signal with a with a kill, or just kill it and and uh, and cause a denial of service. Um, the other thing to consider is that often local privilege escalation uh, flaws. You know, the kernel has some sort of local privilege escalation where a local user can turn their privileges into those of root. Um, that often is considered to be a lesser, um, a lesser severity of, of uh, vulnerability because many people run systems without any untrusted users. And if you don't have any untrusted local users, a privilege escalation is, is sort of a non-event. But um, you do often have a lot of untrusted local users in the sense of the services that you run. So if you're running, you know, some web app uh, using the Apache user or SSHD or something, um, those users, if, if you can compromise those services, those users become the untrusted user and a privilege escalation then can, can uh, lead to a root compromise. If I could hit the right button. There we go. So. Linux uh, has a huge number of different security technologies that, that can be used um, to try to thwart attacks or to reduce the impact of attacks when they do happen. Um, starting with the, the Unix permission model, users and groups, and, and uh, the, you know, um, the ability to, to not allow certain users to access certain sets of, of files. Um, and, uh, then we, we go up, that's the discretionary access control is what that's called, um, because <clears throat> users can decide what permissions to put on their files. Um, unlike the mandatory access control, which is things like SE Linux and Smack, um, which are, <clears throat> which the administrator gets to decide what the permissions on files are. Um, but that's sort of another step up in terms of protection. Um, the, the knock on SE Linux is that it's very complicated. It's also, I think, very, fairly large. Um, it's typically not used in, um, 
in embedded, at least resource constrained embedded environments. Um, although some folks have done that. Uh, there are some like either uh, hacked down versions, smaller versions of SE Linux, or there's SE Android, which r runs on Android systems. Um, Tizen uses uh, Smack, which is another kernel mandatory access system um, as a, a large part of its security model. Then you have the capabilities. Um, capabilities ha are sort of an attempt to take all of the different things that root can do and split them into a fine-grained set of, of capabilities. And then you can apply those capabilities to a particular program selectively so that it only has the pieces of root's privileges that it needs to do its job. Um, in theory, that's all really cool. In practice, it's a little dodgy or it's a little, um, it, it suffers from lack of attention, I think. There's really no capabilities maintainer in the kernel. The capabilities were added haphazardly. They were assigned haphazardly. Um, and so, you know, there are ones like Capsys Admin, which is this huge thing that covers a whole raft of different uh, kinds of uh, abilities. And then there are um, <clears throat> some that are very focused. There are also quite a number of them that can be used to leverage to get root privileges. So really using them as a restrictor so that you can't get all of root doesn't really work. Uh, Brad Spengler did a sort of a study on, on, I don't know, like a dozen or so of them that can, that can lead to root. Uh, the SecComp Sandbox is something that's uh, relatively new. It's been added uh, in the last year or so. And um, it, allows, it'll, it allows a process to limit what, it, what, it's chi what a child process can do in terms of the system calls that it can make and the arguments to the system calls that it can pass. So it was originally done for the Chrome uh, browser or at least that was the reason that the person who wrote the code uh, was interested in it, uh, but a lot of other things are starting to use it as well. The idea for Chrome was that the renderer could be spawned off with only the set of system calls that it needed to do its job, and then if there was a, you know, a JPEG vulnerability, and the, the renderer then would be very limited in what it could do uh, if it got hit by that vulnerability. Um, there are others. Um, Linux certainly does not suffer from a dearth of, um, <clears throat> of security systems. So namespaces aren't new by any means. Um, they go quite a ways back. Um, Alviro added what we now call the mount name system as Name or sorry, mount namespace as uh, as just the namespace, quite a ways back. Um, and he, at that time, at least he was not thinking that there would be other namespaces. But since that time, there have been another five added, I guess. And <clears throat> with the advent recently of the user namespace, uh, with large chunks of which were just merged for 3.8, which was released what last week. Um, namespaces, at least conceptually, at some level, are complete. Uh, there's still certainly work to be done for namespaces, but um, the sort of conceptual whole is, is, uh, is there, or at least visible on the horizon. Um, what they are is they are a way to um, partition global resources within the kernel so that different sets of processes have different views of these global resources. So you could imagine a group of processes that sees process IDs that are different from those of a different group of processes, let's say. So the, <clears throat> the process IDs that this group sees are a subset of the process IDs that this group sees, and the numbers make no correspondence between, between them. Um, or you could imagine that a set of processes have a certain view of the network, what network devices there are, that's entirely different and doesn't correspond to the, the network devices in, that another group of processes sees. 
Same goes with the mount, the, the file system tree um, and others. Um, so it's, it's a way to take the global resources of the kernel and split them into separate groups that certain processes that are members of a particular namespace can see. Um, it was done, or at least from the outside, it seems to be um, <clears throat> focused on containers. The idea of a, of a sort of a lightweight vir virtualization where you have a set of processes that see a vision of the, of the system that makes it appear that they are the only ones running on that system. That there is no other system, or that there is no, you know, that they are in their own system, and, and but what's really happening is they're running on, a, on the same kernel, possibly with many others of these same containers. Um, it's, it's a lightweight virtualization instead of um, hardware virtualization or you know where you have virtual machines and you have separate kernels for each one and separate fi file systems and so on you can share the resources of the same kernel and so and some of the resources of the file systems um, and it's a, a much lighter weight solution uh, there are a number of reasons you might want to do that um, certainly testing and debugging um, you can set up a little environment that, you know, on your Fedora system is, let's say, and I'll show sort of an example of this later, uh, a Debian SID system, and you can go in there and, you know, inside of that namespace, it acts just like a Debian SID system. It uses the, the executables from Debian SID and, and so on, um, but it's uh, running on a Fedora kernel in a Fedora you know, normal Fedora user space. Um, so, there, and there are also security um, uh, uses for namespaces. And probably in my description of, of the separation that I, uh, that I described earlier, you could perhaps even see where, where I was headed with that. So there are six different types of namespaces um, currently available, if you're running a 3.8 kernel anyway. Um, the first that was added was the mount namespace. Um, in fact, the, the, the flag for setting up a mount namespace is just new NS, new namespace. As I said, Alvira was not thinking about other namespaces at that time. Um, probably the simplest namespace is the UTS namespace. Um, that name comes from Unix time sharing. There's the struct UTS name where a bunch of names are, are stored, um, like uname uses, for instance. Um, and that namespace allows you to change the host and domain name inside the namespace that's different from the host and domain name outside the namespace. Um, and you can see that in a, in a container situation, you might want to have 20 containers, each with their own host name and domain, well, perhaps not domain name, but perhaps also. Um, <clears throat> and so for the, for the processes running in that namespace, as far as they can tell, they're running on a host with an entirely different name than the processes that are running in the root namespace. Um, you have process, uh, a PID namespace for processes, and, and in that case then, the PIDs inside of the namespace bear no relationship to the PIDs outside of the namespace. Now, you have the root namespace, where it, which has all of the processes in the system. That's, you know, normal Linux. And, you know, it, it may have a, a PID for a particular process that inside the namespace has an entirely different number. Um, so the, if you had a, a container, you, you know, it would be running. It would have its own PID, PID space totally separate from the, from the host, if you will, and, uh, <clears throat> and the, the correspondence between those, you can't, the PIDs that are in the namespace can only be used by system calls and processes in that namespace. If you use a PID that's outside of that namespace, if you somehow magically got a PID number from the, from the host system, it, the system call would fail. There is no PID of that number. Uh, the IPC namespace is for the uh, message queues and semaphores and shared memory uh, stuff. Networking namespace, that's, that's for separating networking between, you know, between these different 
namespaces so that you so that the view of the network inside the namespace is different than the view of the network in another network namespace or outside of that namespace. Um, <clears throat> and then the user namespace does the same thing with UIDs and GIDs. So you have an entirely separate set of UIDs and GIDs inside the, the, the namespace and outside the namespace. And user namespaces are well, part of the, the, of the reason behind them existing is the idea that, you, that regular users will be able to create namespaces. Um, so inside of a namespace, there will, will be a root user, and inside of the namespace, it will have UID zero. Outside of the namespace, that will have a different UID, but let's say it would have my UID because I created the namespace. So outside of the namespace, it has no privileges other than the ones that I have, but inside it's the root user. So if I can create a user, uh, a namespace in which I am root, then I can create other namespaces underneath that of other types, which means that I can create namespaces, <clears throat> that a regular user can create namespaces rather than today's situation without user namespaces where you have to be root to create namespaces. Um, <clears throat> there's, of course, a big issue here. If the, na if the root inside the namespace has privileges outside the namespace, it's a very easy privilege escalation, right? If I can create myself a root user, essentially. Uh, but that's, so that's the work that has been done over the last year or so, well, I'm sure more than that, but um, visibly over the last year or so, is to ensure that the root user inside a namespace does not have any extra privileges outside the namespace. And in fact, as we'll see a, l a little bit later, that's, that job is not quite, is not quite done, um, so you can't build a kernel with, a net, with network file systems and turn on user namespaces at this point. Um, so if you want to build a, a kernel with namespaces, if your distro doesn't come with it or if you're building uh, on some device and you haven't turned them on, it's uh, easy, easy to do. Um, it's in the namespaces support sub-menu, I guess, under general setup. Um, there's a <clears throat> half a dozen different config options. Um, and uh, right now, as I said, Config user namespace depends on the network file systems being turned off because they have not yet, that code has not yet been converted um, to do the right thing for the user ID changes. Um, that, that code is, is in flight now. The patches to, to do that are, are in flight now, and I assume we'll probably land in 3.9, and so then we'll go merrily on our way. Um, so to create a, a namespace, uh, the main sort of entry point to do that is clone, which is uh, <clears throat> sort of the underpinning of fork, I guess, at some level. It's, it's, uh, it's a lower level system call that creates a new process and you can pass flags to it to, uh, to control its behavior. Some of the flags that you can pa pass are these clone underscore new star um, <clears throat> types of uh, flags. Those can be ORed together so that you can get multiple n new namespace types in a single call. So you could, you know, call a clone with a new NS and a new net and get a new mount namespace and a new network namespace that are associated with that, with the process that it creates. Um, unshare is a, uh, is a way to create a new namespace without uh, creating a new process. So es essentially you are um, saying, put me, in this, put me in a new namespace of whatever type you specify with the clone flags. Um, <clears throat> set NS then is a way to join an existing namespace. So the, the trick there, and we'll, and we'll talk about it in a second, is uh, is how you specify what a new what a new namespace it is that you want to join, um, but setNS says you know take take this process and put it in this namespace. Um, 
systemd nspawn is a uh, something that comes with systemd the the uber popular uh, init program that uh, <laughs> uh, nobody has any opinions about but uh, in any case the it, it, it doesn't use systemd, the init process particularly, it can, um, but it, it's, a, it's an interesting program in that it'll, and we'll see it here in a minute, it can set up uh, a container for, uh, for playing around in um, very easily. It's also um, a pretty nicely, uh, easily, easy to read piece of code um, that uses uh, things like namespaces and bind mounts and and some of the kinds of techniques that you that you might want to use if you were going to use namespaces, um, you know, for security and for partitioning on a uh, system. Um, so it, it's it's worth looking at, even if you hate systemd. You know, there's the the the, the code is there. It's free. It's it's um, it's interesting stuff. So here's my attempt at a at a uh, diagram. To, to sort of give you the idea of what, uh, what these namespaces look like. Um, so you have the root namespace, right? When, when you boot your machine and you, you know, log in, or even if you don't log in, there's you know, a single namespace that's running, that's the root namespace, and it's you know, for all of the different namespace types. Um, and so what, we, what we're showing here is we've created a child namespace let's say with a clone, and we did a clone new PID and a clone, and a clone new NS. So we got a new PID, PID namespace and a new mount namespace. And so when we did that, the, wow, okay. So, you know, the, the, the new process that was created was 238 in the, in the root namespace, and that became one in and i.e. I. init in the child namespace. And then sometime later, somebody did a PSAX in the child namespace, which was PID 12 there, which corresponds to PID 249 in, in the root namespace. So the, the, those processes are the same, but this in, inside the child, if you referred to PID 249, you would get nowhere because that PID doesn't exist. Um, you would have to refer to PID 12 or PID 1. Or, and uh, sort of similarly, we've got, this, uh, we've got this mount point, serve SID, that um, is mapped to the slash in the, inside the child namespace. Um, and so the child namespace can't see serve SID. It can only see slash. Um, and then systemd nspawn, uh, you know, does... Um, you know, uh, mounts some things like slash proc and slash uh, private slash temp and a few other things like that that are completely contained within the child namespace and can't be seen in the, in the root namespace. That's the, that's the separation, that's the level of separation. So when I, earlier when I talked about uh, set NS, I said you needed a way to be able to have a reference to a particular namespace. Well, when a process is created, well, all processes have a proc PID NS directory, um, and under that directory, depending on which of these namespaces you've actually configured into your kernel, it will have entries for mount PID, UTS, IPC, net, and user. Um, the, those are magic kernel files, essentially, um, that uh, can be used to reference the namespace. So, and we'll, and we'll see sort of an example of this later. The <clears throat> if you need the mount namespace of a given process, you can open the proc pid ns mount for that pid, and that will give you a reference to that mount namespace. You can pass that. FD to set NS if you wanted to put another pro, you know, put yourself into that mount namespace. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, that's what those are for. Another issue that uh, can be confusing depending on how your uh, distribution is set up, um, many distributions uh, by default um, propagate their mount, they, they do what's called mount namespace propagation. 
So you probably would expect, given what we've said so far, that if you have two mount namespaces and you mount something in one of them, that you don't see it in the other. And that would be the sort of the normal situation, but because of the way mount namespaces are often used, many distributions, or, or I don't know about many, some distributions will, by default, make it so that those mounts are visible outside of the namespace. Basically, they'll propagate the mount into other namespaces that refer to the same mount point. Uh, you can change that behavior. So, so there are sort of three different modes. There's private, which is sort of what you would think of as the, as the proper way to do it, given what mount namespaces are supposed to be, right? The, in that, if I have a, have a mount point here, and it's, it's in these two namespaces, and I mount something on it here, it's not seen here, and vice versa. That's, that's a private. Um, shared is the reverse of that. You always see whatever, whatever happens. And then there's this idea of slave. So if, it, if this namespace mounts a file system, or sorry, uh, it, the mount point is marked as a slave, it will see any changes that the parent namespace does, or grandparent, or whatever, but, it will not, but whatever it does will not propagate to the parent or grandparent. And there are recursive versions of those um, types that so you can <clears throat> basically you can change uh, how the mount points are treated and um, it can be very confusing trust me on this if you uh, <clears throat> are playing around with mount namespaces and you mount you know and you didn't realize that your distribution does this to you you mount something inside and you expect that it's not going to be seen outside and if the thing that you mount is slash proc it makes it even more interesting um, so anyway be be aware of uh, of the fact that sometimes that some distributions will will do that and, and in this case systemd on fedora is doing that by uh, <clears throat> doing that by default is making all mount points shared. Um, so it's easy to turn that off, but you have to know that it's ha you know, have to know that it's happening in order to do that. So let's go ahead and if I can manage not to mess this up too terribly, look at So I have a directory here called serve that has <clears throat> two subdirectories, rawhide and SID, which are sort of maybe exactly what you'd expect them to be. I used yum in the rawhide case and deb bootstrap in the SID case to grab sort of the rudiments of a rawhide or SID system into these directories. So they look pretty similar. Um, and uh, so the, these are just directories, and I'm just running as root on my normal system. I just have two shells here running, running as root. And um, so, but if we use systemd end spawn, to start a container, um, what it calls a container on serve SID, we uh, we now it has now created um, multiple namespaces for this process. The process being the shell, and um, and mounted things in such a way that the that these the uh, root directory is that serve SID directory, and. So now I can run commands inside of, inside of the, this uh, container, and I'm running the Debian versions of these commands. Um, so you can see that that, that, that is, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah, the, that is the, um, all of the processes that are running inside of here. Um, you can see that the PID, PID1 is the, is the shell, 
Um, and, uh, but outside of the container, if we look, you can see this end spawn here has created this bash, 5506, and if we look, we can see that all of the different namespaces that this, that that process belongs to. And if we look at this, we'll see the namespaces that a command just in my regular root namespace has different identifiers for the IPC, for the mount namespace, it has the same for the net namespace, different for the PID, same for the user, and different for the UTS. And if we look, I mean, my, my prompt sort of shows it, right? The host name here is Oozle. Here it's Sid, that's the different U UTS namespace. And that's something that, that systemd end spawn sets up automatically. And so then we can do things like, um, touch a file in the temp directory. And if we do, there's that file. And if we bind mount, onto, if I could type, I'd be dangerous, right? So now if we cat, we get the password file. Come in here, uh, no, <laughs> am I suffering from demo wear here? I'll swear this all worked an hour ago, of course. Um, well, I guess I'll describe what, what, what worked an hour ago. It's very odd. Um, so you, you could mount it, set a password. You, you look at it on the, look at it inside the container, and it was still just an empty file because I touched it over there, and that's, that's how I created it. I could echo something into it. It was there in the, in, inside the container. Outside of the container, it was not. Um, and uh, I have no idea what's, uh, what happened there. But anyway, um, it, uh, that's the kind of, uh, of separation that the container is supposed to provide. I wonder if my mount propagation <laughs> got changed. Anyway, um, seems like there was, oh, so one other thing that can possibly screw up, um, if we, so, sorry, let's go back in there, and if we do an IF config, I've actually not been able to get my wireless to work very well here, but if we do an IF config inside the container, you see there's an ETH0 and a loop back, and if I could get out, <laughs> things like pinggoogle.com would work. But if we <coughs> add private network, no E0. But here, we still have an ETH zero, and we could have a WLAN zero if I could actually get on the net. Um, <clears throat> so the, the view of the network between the two is different. Yeah. 
So if we talk about some examples of the kinds of things that you could do um, to use this namespace um, idea to separate and either eliminate a whole class of things that a, a, an attacker or a um, compromised uh, binary could do, or, or at least l limit it severely. Um, so if, if like, we were talk like I was talking about earlier, we have an update checker that periodically checks with an update server, and we're concerned that somebody man in the middle gets in, the, gets in there and in some way messes with it, um, and, and we're worried about what kinds of things it, it might be able to do under those circumstances, we could set it up in its own mount namespace, just, just put the things inside the mount namespace that, that uh, it needs to run, you know, mount them read-only so that it, it uh, can do very little, put it, have a private temp that's accessible to the outside, but, and that's all, that's all it gets, and the update checker can check for updates and put, uh, put a file into that private temp, and that's all it can do. And if it gets compromised, it can, check for updates and put a file in that temp and that's all it can do. Now it still has access to the network because we haven't put it into its own network namespace. That's another thing that could be done. Um, it could be put into its own network namespace and, the <clears throat> and some kind of con connection could be handed down to it that it could use to periodically check. Um, or, uh, or the network namespace could be configured in such a way that it can only talk to a particular set of hosts because each network namespace, because they, if, if you put uh, network devices into a network namespace, then um, each one gets its own set of IP tables and so can have its own firewall rules. Um, so there, there are a number of different things you could do there. You could, you could run multiple in, instances of a web application in separate PID namespaces. Maybe this web application takes passwords and, or usernames and passwords from users and then does something, whatever it is that it does. And so an attacker wants to try and get those passwords perhaps and would subvert one of those processes to then p-trace the others and, and get information out of those processes. You could turn off p-tracing, or there are a variety of things that can be done there, or put them in separate PID namespaces. Then the, then the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the one that gets compromised can't even see the PID to p-trace the other. Um, you could combine that, the, those sort of those two ideas to isolate some web application. I just pick on CMSs and PHP because they seem to be constantly in the news with uh, various kinds of flaws. Um, even further, um, set up a, a network namespace to run HTTPD worker processes. So you, so you spawn off a worker process, you hand it the, the uh, <coughs> file descriptor of the, of the connected socket from the client, and it can handle that one particular connection. Um, and it, if that worker process gets compromised, it has no access to the network. Um, you can uh, have uh, separate network namespaces. I think I sort of, Sammy mentioned this earlier. Go ahead. One question now, I understand how to separate things, but how do I get the files that actually have to be shared in order to work together into the namespace? So the application can work on the data it needs to work on. So uh, files or files or yeah files for example. Well, uh, you, you could you could mount them, right? I mean the the, the mount the separate mount namespaces don't eliminate shared files, right? I mean you can <coughs> you can still have the same thing mounted in this namespace and that namespace, and they can see the files. But if you mount something differently, it's do, do you see do you see the distinction I'm making? Well, if you want to share them via files, if you wanted to share them another way, you could, you know, pass file descriptors via Unix sockets or, you know, there's a whole variety of different techniques for doing that. Does that make sense? Good. Well, in your example, you could tell that you're in a container. Um, is that always 
container? You could tell that you were in a container because... Uh, for instance, PID is uh, challenged every minute. Oh, the, the name of the... That, no, it, that's just that's an artifact of how SystemD NSPOD set, set that up. There, there's actually another mode that you can run SystemD NSPOD in where um, it will run SystemD and actually boot up the container, and so then, then the process one will be init. So, so uh, you can arrange it so you can't. Yes, yes. Other questions? Going once. So I think this is pretty much all I have. I haven't looked at FreeBSD jails in a long time, so anything I would say would probably not be. I mean, it is a lightweight virtualization kind of idea, also, and it, and it's um, specifically targeted at security applications. Um, as I remember, it's also specifically targeted at the file system, not. Uh, you know, things like processes or network or that sort of thing, but I, I could be well out of date. I don't claim to be an expert. Okay. <laughs> I know there's parallels to what's going on here. It sounds like this offers more a finer granularity. I, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, if, if my knowledge of jails is correct, which that could be in question or is in question, um, then I thought that that was mostly, mostly targeted at the file system and separating the, the view of the file system inside of the jail from the view of the file system out of the jail. Um, but I could be wrong about that. And if so, then this adds more capabilities and like you say, it's finer, finer grained, if you will. Green? Um, so this is actually kind of like the vServer stuff from about 10 years ago. The what? The vServer stuff. It used to be. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's come through a variety of different routes, right? There's all the LXC stuff, and yeah, okay. Well, I mean, it's kind of like linearly somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're all, they're, yeah. I mean, they're all related, and, and you know, basically, uh, this is what people were eventually able to get merged. Yes, okay. <laughs> that, I guess that was my question. Right, okay. Yes. So uh, uh, the question is, uh, like, uh, is there anything that can, uh, like, a partition, uh, like, a, like a block device, like do, do things like copy and write and stuff, such that you can, I mean, isolate uh, it at the device level, like the storage level? Like, is, isn't that true about containers that we have two separate containers? Uh, and it's, can do things like copy on write, uh, uh, oh, they can they can share some storage and and then do do copy on write if if one of them changes it essentially. Yeah. But I'm sure, but I don't. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. I'm afraid. Sorry. No, they're not exactly synonyms. You, you know, I mean, a container is sort of a, a conceptual thing, and a namespace is sort of part of the implementation that can be used to create a container, right? And um, you know, containers often also use control groups, you know, to to uh, restrict the the amount of um, uh, resources that the that the container can get. Um, so the container is sort of a, a bigger thing, and namespace is a piece of the implementation for a container. Right. Okay. So I guess the shared, shared block device uh, concept probably applies more to containers and not namespaces. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Namespace doesn't kind of partition everything, but like containers, like it's like what if two different containers try to like do the same funny things to the, to the same block device, like, you know, well, 
Well, I, I mean, that, that's, a, that's essentially no different than if two processes on a regular system try and do weird things to the, to the block device, right? I mean, they both have to have permissions to it, and if you do that, sort of all bets are off, right? I mean, this is, this is at the file system layer. The, the mount namespace is at the file system layer, so it's dealing with file systems and not block devices. I mean, obviously down below somewhere there's a block device. Yes? Say, for example, I'm inside a container, I'm root. I am in on that mem and I open that mem. What do I see? Like, can I snoop inside the actual memory of the hardware and possibly mess with what's happening in your well, the, you're talking about a user namespace, so you're... So you, in general, like, if I, yeah, if, I guess if I were root... I mean, because uh, if, you're, if you're root yes. in a non-user namespace, then you're root, period. Okay. Right. If I root in a user namespace, and I try to open that man inside the container, what, do I get permission denied? Um, well, the, the, that's a good question. The, one of the things that systemd nspawn does is set, <laughs> set up... Um, a, a device tree, and that's the wrong term, a, a, a dev directory um, that uh, contains the limited things needed for, so there is, so there is no dev, dev mem in here, and this is not a user namespace either, so that's not really a helpful answer uh, to your, yeah, your question. Not the, the device, no? um, well, as it turns out, systemd nspawn does not, uh, drops the capability for make nod. So you can't make nod, um, I forget the syntax, but what is it? Name B234256. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the regular route has lots of abilities that to probably circumvent much of what go you know much of what uh, namespaces try to separate right regular root is maybe not all powerful anymore but it has all sorts of tricks up its sleeve so typically in a, in a, when you're going to uh, roll this kind of thing out you're going to be running it as some other user either in a user namespace or as just some regular uh, less privileged user inside the namespace, you know, the re a regular root namespace user, but less privileged, you know, like Apache for the HTTPD or something. Can, can you contrast this with, uh, I know you spoke of SSH before, but can you contrast where, you know, each serves its purpose? I think you need Dan Walsh here. Um, <laughs> the yeah, I mean, SE Linux is a very complicated system. Um, I think it's getting better in the sense that the Fedora folks and the RHEL folks are uh, really riding herd on it to try to reduce that complexity. But I still turn it off the first thing I do when I install Fedora, and I'm arguably a security guy at some level, right? So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean... SE Linux has its place, but yeah, I'm not sure the embedded space is where 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 that space is. I mean, it's it's pretty um, resource intensive for one thing, um, but uh, it's complicated. But the, on the flip side of that, SE Linux does very well in sort of non-dynamic environments, right, where things aren't changing. Um, so you don't have to relabel, and you don't have to, you know, think of all the different possibilities of who wants to access what, right? If it has a, a set sort of functions, then then SE Linux might be right. Does that sort of answer your question? It does. I mean, I guess the, the, they, have, they have different origins, right? This kind of stems from people wanting to host multiple websites on the same kind of box, whereas SE Linux kind of comes from the military kind of thinking. Sort of, although one of the things that the folks at Red Hat are doing, they have this uh, open shift. They have so many open things, but yeah, open shift, I think, where you can just sign up on their website and you get a container, essentially, um, with an Apache web server and some amount of, you know, like Django or Rails or whatever, 
installed and you can go build a web app in this OpenShift thing and that's done using sort of a combination of containers and SE Linux. Oh, okay. yeah. And these days now it's actually been sort of plumbed into systemd so that when that connection comes in and the user authenticates, then systemd spawns this container and switches everything down to it and, and off things go. Other questions? Yes. Uh, a, a network device that that, that gets hot plugged. Um, well, there there shouldn't be any uh, barriers to yeah. To, I mean the, the the namespace support right where where the it, it will allow you to make these namespaces is targeted. You know the network one is targeted at network devices. So if your device got plugged in and came up as a network device, yes, it could be you know, put into this namespace and some other thing put into a different namespace and so on. And I think I'm run, running out of time. Thank you.